How's it going, everybody? And welcome to episode 196 of Master My Garden podcast. Now, this week's episode, we're going back across the Atlantic, and I'm delighted to be joined this week by Jennifer Jewell. And I suppose it's a sort of a review of a brand new book that she has called What We Sow. And it's a personal ecologi- ecological and cultural significance of seeds. So we're going we're gonna to delve into that book quite a bit. But there's also other topics that I'm sure we're going to cover because Jennifer is a podcast host herself. Her podcast, Cultivating Place, is almost up at 400 episodes at this stage and uh, that's uh, yeah that's quite a that's quite a feat so we'll we'll chat about that a little bit she's also a gardener she's a garden writer so she's lots of strings to the bow so we could go every any av- avenue with this conversation but to, predominantly we're going to talk about the new book what we saw so jennifer you're very very welcome to master my garden podcast oh i'm so happy to be here really uh such a pleasure and thank you you're very welcome. So, yeah, I got a copy of your new book by Timber Press recently, and uh, it's What We Sow. Let me show a copy of it. So it's What We Sow on a Personal, Ecological and Cultural Significance of Seeds. And having looked at it, it's it's a lovely book, lots of really interesting stuff in it. And it's a kind of a mix of, I suppose, various types of books. There's a slight element of taking you through a year, a diary a diary like uh, step by step through the year. Uh, it also looks at, I suppose, the origins of seeds, the backstories to seed and the things that people may or may not know about, you know, the history and what happens behind the seeds when you buy that pack of seed in a, in a garden center or online. And it's, I suppose, there's a lot of really important topics covered in it and mentioned in it. You know, things like food security and, you know, who actually owns all the seeds, uh, essentially, and all those type of really important issues. So we'll we'll get into it first and maybe tell us a little bit about the, I suppose, the catalyst or the idea behind starting yeah. this book. And then maybe tell us about the book itself. Um. Yeah, all those things are are true. It was. It was March of 2020. You all remember March of 2020, (laughs) right? Um, And I was actually going out on the road for a speaking tour around the publication of my first book, The Earth in Her Hands, which is a kind of collection of profiles of women in leadership roles in horticulture or horticulturally adjacent fields around the globe. And all of my books, this is my third book, because as I was publishing The Earth in Her Hands, I was turning in the manuscript for my second book, Under Western Skies. And all three of the books together actually are a perfect trifecta illustrating kind of the the premise, the purpose, the process of my podcast, which is really trying to push, nudge, shove, encourage the gardening world based on mainstream garden media, away from this idea of just what our gardens look like or just how to garden, so that we think a little bit more at a meta level about why we're gardening and what how we're gardening means to our planet, to our cultures, to ourselves. Because, And I think it's true in the European realm as well, that, you know, we we hit this sort of 20-year period, maybe, um, no, 70-year period, sort of 1950 to, to 2010, 2015, where most of the focus was on gardens as these sort of two-dimensional, very pretty status symbols of the middle or upper class, uh, mostly at, at least through the lens of mainstream garden media, magazines, books, television programs, uh, mostly done as a like really pretty little hobby, but not uh, a really powerful possible agent or space of change. And you you know where we got as a result of that. We got a lot of very beautiful throw pillows, a lot of pesticides and herbicides, a lot of destroyed ecosystems and habitats and a food system that was completely out of our own understanding, let alone control. And so I'm on this speaking tour for the earth in her hands, which really is trying to 
push the envelope of what we see a gardener looks like and what we see they are possible of doing in our world based on leadership at, you know, big botanic gardens or public policy or on the ground ecology or plant introduction and production. And two weeks into what was supposed to be a nine week tour, we go into shutdown. California became the first, I live in California, I'm based in Northern interior, Northern California. So not on the like posh coast, but in the like working class sort of, you know, scrappy interior part of the state. And California was the first state to shut down. I was in New York City at the time. And all of a sudden, what was supposed to be a nine week tour became much shorter and I needed to get home. But what my partner and I realized at that moment was we hadn't planned for our spring garden. Now we garden all year round. We have you know, a lot of ecosystem kind of habitat garden. He lives on 20 acres in the wild lands outside of town. I have a small house in a kind of suburban development in this medium sized town. Um, and, but we hadn't planned for our vegetable spring garden. And mm -hmm. so while we're trying to get airline tickets back home to California, we're also trying to order seed because all of a sudden we realize we will have time and we would like a garden. And over and over again, we kept getting what all of you also got, I'm sure, were a lot of messages saying out of stock, back ordered, not available. And it was this kind of epiphany of like, what? How is that even possible? Like, yeah. how are we out of seeds already? Um, and that, you know, although it's wildly unreasonable, it triggers this mammalian fear of if I can't buy seed, how do I feed myself? Now, I don't even come close to feeding myself with my garden. So that is not what we're talking about. But it's this this primal fear, understanding that our disconnection from seeds has some really terrifying consequences. And so it set me out on this journey um, which, as you say, I contextualize in the kind of natural history and garden world of my own happening across the course of the year. And as different things occur in my own garden life, like you have to plant your lettuce seeds or you have to thin your carrot seeds or the seed catalogs come in or whatever it might be, each of those moments kind of triggered a research project for me, like what is the history of seed production? Who are the seed sellers? Do they actually grow the seed? Uh, what is the law around what's on those seed packets that arrive to me? And uh, what, where does most of the seed come from and how is it cared for where it is sourced originally? Like all of these questions. And as you say, they, they, each one of these sort of research rabbit trails led me into both horrifying information um, around control and care, but also really, really, really uplifting information in terms of the diversity of humans out there caring for the land, caring for the seed, keeping it in the commons. Um, so there's a slog through the middle of the book in the depressing parts, but you come out the other side recognizing that, um, you know, people like you are out there. People like these seed keepers whose names we, some of whom we've heard, some of whom we haven't, they're working really hard. And we as gardeners have a little bit, in my opinion, of an obligation and the joy of of knowing more about this and being more active uh, participants in how seed is cared for in our world. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. There's about 10 different topics that I'm going to pick up on. Right. <laughs> um, we, we, we're going to at some point go back to the first book because you mentioned some really interesting points there. We might go back to that in a minute. Just to to, to drive further into this, the, the hard slog through the middle of the book. And I was at a, a really good uh, speaking event recently where a very good gardener by the name of Colm O'Driscoll here in Ireland was given a talk on vegetable growing, basically. And seed seed came up as a topic and he he put a slide up, which I was sort of vaguely aware of, but not entirely aware of. And it was a diagram showing all these different seed brands 
an arrow going back up to a source, a source going back up further to a multinational, and eventually ending up where every every seed, you know, or a lot of the seed that's available throughout the world is being, I suppose, controlled and owned by a number of rather large corporations who um mm. who mm. are synonymous in other parts of you know farming and so on and that even though i was aware of it it it's very very stark when you see that there is so much control of a food system by so few companies who to be quite honest probably don't have our best interests at, at heart we know they don't right like this the the statistics are that the there are four large petrochemical or pharmaceutical corporations or both bear monsanto pharmaceutical and petrochemical corporations who control 60 percent of our seed supply in the world four and their primary interest is in selling those pharmaceuticals and those petrochemical products by way of attaching them to seed or making them um uh you know, um, integrated with the seed and the seed cycle. And and what they care about is selling their product and their product is toxic and owning the other product, which is the seed, so that we have to keep buying the toxic. And, you know, I know I sound like an off the wall liberal when I when I'm speaking this way, but no matter who you are, when you think about that, and you you go back to the sort of ideals of the green revolution and the industrialized world going into the third world to help them grow their plants better and feed the world better by you know using these synthetic fertilizers and using these synthetic insecticides or herbicides or fungicides because it was going to feed a growing population and make the world better like high protein rice or wheat or whatever it is the fact is that hasn't panned out. And so to to tell me that that's the reason and we need to feed these billions of people, it hasn't worked. What has worked is that all of those insecticides, petrochemical and pharmaceutical residues have poisoned our soils, our waters, our food systems, and made most of the world's land-based farmers that get involved in this or get bullied into it um, has put them in an indebtedness cycle that does nobody any good and reduced the diversity of not just our food crops, right? Because our food crops are directly related to our wild native plants. Like we, the food crops just didn't come up out of nowhere as food crops. They all have wild progenitors. They are directly related to the biodiversity of our native plants around the globe. So this is a like false question we keep being asked. And therefore we don't come up with the right answers because we can't, it's a false question. We need to start, especially as gardeners, asking different questions. And the distance between me as a suburban home gardener in Northern California and the mess of indebtedness cycle, uh, indebtedness cycle of farmers in India, it seems like it's a big distance, but it's not. Because if you put all the home gardeners just across the, the North, North America, since the pandemic, we have about 75% of all U.S. households are engaged in gardening. They are, after the pandemic, really paying attention and they care. If all of us, or even even 75% of that 75% made the decision that they did not want chemicals in their soil, food, and water, we would stop buying them. If we stop buying them, that is a significant economic disincentive for these corporations to keep going the way they're going and to think about reevaluating. It also puts the power back on us for where we put our votes and where we put our dollars as to the world we want to see, because we can choose to invest in small, locally based or even midsize locally based regional seed networks and just pull ourselves out of that cycle, period. And and we have the dollars to do it. Yeah, there's no question. It's because it is, and I know when, what you've said, when you gather all these gardeners around around you know Northern America, Ireland, 
Europe yeah. and beyond. There is, there is, I suppose, mass in numbers. Um, on the flip side of that, you are fighting back against quite a big, huge. Uh, quite a huge, uh, I suppose, element. And on top of that, and I think this is why conversations and books like yours are very important, is there's, there is definitely a lack of understanding because people are growing their own food here in Ireland. They're picking their seed packets off the shelf, but they have no awareness that those seed are actually controlled by, you know, these right. corporations. In many cases, uh, they are, right? Yeah. And I suppose the the steps needed are many and they're, they can be quite small. So that might be a case of, you know, looking local, local seed producers, um, I suppose, open pollinated varieties, heirloom yep. varieties, trying to keep all of these alive. And yep. I, I know you talk a bit about seed banks in in your book and, you know, that there's a lot of these seeds in storage. And I always feel, uh, and I had this conversation recently, recently in relation to wildflowers, the best place for seeds is in the soil and growing. Yeah. And so that's that's why I think gardeners, that's the very first point. If you want to take yeah. steps, I think that's a really good step to take is, is source your seed from local reputable. And I think you mentioned in your book as well, I think it's important to highlight that local family businesses, as you perceive them, their source, you need to ask the question in relation to their source need, as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you just hit the nail on the head is that the first step is actually making some of these systems visible to us. They have been so far removed from us that we cannot see them anymore. And and in many cases, that's by design so that, you know, it's so convenient and it's so easy and it will save you time and you don't have to think about these things. We've got it. We'll we'll take care of it back here. But if they're not taking care of it with the same things we think we value in mind, then we are being complicit in these very systems we are um fighting against or complaining about or, you know, so we have the ability um, to ask the questions at our nurseries about the plants. Are, are they seed grown? If they're seed grown, where did that seed come from? How was that seed care, cared for? Are they treated with neonicotinoids? Now, I think in Ireland and in England, that's much less of a problem because you have banned so many of those things yeah. way before we did. But here we have to ask that question like are you know pollinator plants being sold to us in our big box stores often come laced with neonicotinoids now like there's a conundrum right like buy this and then poison your monarch butterflies good job um and as gardeners we want to do the right thing um and so asking the questions and actually taking I don't know, a half an hour a week out of our normal social media streams to do this research or follow someone that's telling us hard things um, and just try and learn more about the systems, that that helps us make better decisions. It, it means that I don't go to the hardware store to buy my seed. I go to you, John, and I say, hey, I really love that zucchini you shared with me or courgette you shared with me last week do you are you going to save seed from that one if you are will you please share some with me um and you know and returning at one of the seed keepers that i interview in the book and who is a through line uh, a sort of narrative from start to finish in the book is a man named jeff quatron and he has really done this incredible work in the state of New Jersey here, reviving, finding, researching, and reviving these heritage open pollinated uh, tomato varieties that were all bred there in New Jersey. And they have sort of historic cultural stories that go with them. And he's been able to recover, I think, seven different of, of these varieties. And one of the things he says uh, in response to what you just said about um, those big corporations like we are little we are many but we are still little we do not have their resources we do not have their strategy um but the the bigger the mainstream the bigger the space for the undercurrent and the stronger the undercurrent can can be and i think that's what we have to remember is like and he's sort of like every single seed you plant that is power to the people go <laughs> um and i i'm i'm with him on that like 
we get overwhelmed by thinking we are supposed to fight Bear Monsanto this week or the state of California or the government of the U.S. or Ireland or the you know England. But just starting with our own gardens, making sure that that seed is coming from somewhere you want it to come from, growing a little bit of your own food, diversifying the native plants and the flowering plants and the edible plants in your own garden, that's a pretty good start. Like, just start there. Yeah, that's a great, great start. And I suppose that another good step after that is to be conscious of where you're buying. And you you sort of alluded to it a little bit earlier, uh, where you're buying your food and, you know, farmers markets and supporting sort of smaller time growers will be a really good way of doing it. And I started thinking and I was thinking about it as I was as I was looking through your book during the week, there was I was on um, holidays, not in the summer just gone, but the summer of 2022 in mm-hmm. Tuscany. And there was, so we went out on the bikes, uh, myself and my wife, two girls went out on the bikes and we came across this little, what would you call it, little vegetable shop. It was, there was no houses around. It was just a vegetable shop on a crossroads. And so we went in for a look, they were selling coffee and whatever. We went in for a look and around the the shop was several fields of different vegetables and fruits and inside in it there was a, a lady she was well in her 80s I would say uh, running this shop she had seed that she had saved herself from the previous season for sale there and her husband was going around on a little mini tractor so while we were there she sold her last two melons I, it might not be melons but whatever it was she sold her last two of, of a certain thing And off he went on his tractor and came back with six from the next field. And I just thought that system, that food system was so brilliant. And I remember speaking about it on the podcast the next week. That's the type of thing. Now, that's I suppose that's the utopia of it. But there is loads of those type farmers markets. And I think that's another good step in, in, I suppose, taking back some level of control and keeping it local and keeping it to community, uh, which is really important as well. Right. And and this is something that we it became very visible to us during the pandemic is that when global supply chains faltered, little local economic systems picked right up. And, you know, our farmers were producing their carrots and their lettuce and their and all of a sudden they became the visible supply chain that saved us. And, you know, in many cases and kept our world interesting and diverse and delicious and fresh. And I think we have to be, I think this is exactly the moment, you know, 2023, things are starting to go back to normal, super easy to go to the grocery store or, you know, big Sainsbury's or whatever your chain grocery store is and just pick those things all up. But we, we stop supporting those local systems at our own peril and at the peril of our health and the health of the world around us, economically, socially, and environmentally. And so, you know, and and there's some much greater joy, right? Do you ever go to Sainsbury's and come back with carrots and have a smile (laughs) on your face? No, You, you, you just do what you're doing. But you go to that farm and you know that farmer and his wife and their seeds and their melons, and, and they do exist almost everywhere still. There aren't as many, but they are still there. And so if we support them, if we become them, um, then we help to keep that system hydrated, even in the face of a global supply chain that is disgusting to most of us. Yeah, and uh, we, we could we could stay going down that avenue. That is, the I suppose, the darker side of seeds and the darker mm. side of, of food production. A, yeah. And there is like seeds, they're a symbol of hope. You know, there's so many quotes about, you know, sowing seed and and what that means and the hope that that brings. And that's, I suppose, a huge part of your book as well. So maybe we'll talk about that side of it now. Definitely. And, you know, I, I kind of opened the book with this idea of how intimately just the word seed, whether it's a noun or a verb, is integrated into the English language for sure. Um, and I don't think it's just the American English language. You know, you we we seed 
clouds, we see change, we see war, you know, our own um, bodily fluids for procreation, you know, or spilling seed. We, it, there, are, there are all of these ways in which we use seed as a metaphor and it is completely, you know, um, permeates most of our large religious language too. So whether it's, you know, the uh, Christian tradition, the Judaic tradition, the Buddhist, or like seed is a symbol as the beginning. And most creation stories come with some idea of a living being, whether that's a, an animal or a human, but generally it's an animal pulling seed out of nothing um, and creating the world. Um, sometimes it's a, you know, I guess sort of friendly man in the sky that we call God, the, you know, coming down and giving seed to Adam and Eve. But the point here is that it is a very, very powerful metaphor for what we see as the creative life force. And so to, to contrast, you know, and, and the indigenous land-based cultures, and I can't, of course, speak for all of them or any of them uh, specifically, but there is this universal concept in the worldviews of indigenous and land-based cultures that seeds are actually our ancestors. They are relatives of ours that have taken care of us over generations. And that to then cover them with poison and destroy the very environments in which they are grown. Like these are the two opposing views. And, um, and it's, it, especially, you know, I, I mostly focus on North America. Those are the politics that I, I sort of understand. And I have the most intimacy with, I get a little bit into um, some of the seed keeping networks that have really come to the fore in Ireland and, uh, Great Britain in the last sort of 10 years who are fighting for some of these common rights. Um, and, but the, the number of people in seed banks, in seed libraries, in cultural uh, kind of rematriation of seeds back to their people, like these are stories that are so full of hope. There is a whole group here on the Pacific coast of the U.S. called Second Generation Seeds. And it was started by, you know, two or three young people of Asian descent, really working to try and refine research and then regrow and send out into the world all of these seeds of the Asian diaspora, seeds and seed keeping knowledge that was lost during World War II when the Asian population, you know, and a, a large horticultural contingent in that population were, you know, imprisoned during World War II here. And so some of this retrieving of seed and knowledge back into the populations of Asian descent is like this great homecoming. And it's it's true of the indigenous seed keepers network here. There's a whole host of people in the southeast, but but throughout the country who are working on documenting and sharing forward seeds of the African diaspora, seeds that were brought over with the enslaved for um during that period of time, but then were integrated into the US culture, you know claimed to be European discoveries, you know, and this is like how you care and grow for in indigo or rice cultivation in the Southeast. Like these were all seeds and knowledge that were um, appropriated from different cultures and removed from that cultural recognition. And they are now trying to be reintegrated. And the work being done on those fronts is it, like, it gives you so much hope. You're like, if you can do this and you have overcome so many obstacles put in your way, um, the rest of us can support you in doing this. For sure. And what do you see as being the importance of that to, to the average gardener listening? I think the importance of that is that we keep talking about biodiversity loss across the planet, right? We talk about 
fragmented habitats, the, you know, the, the reports coming out of Germany of the loss of however many millions of insect species and what that means to us environmentally. We talk about the loss of food diversity where there used to be, you know, 150 apples that we all enjoyed and used for different things, baking, cooking, eating fresh cider. And now we have like four that are on our shelves regularly, right? If you increase the diversity of people who are cultivating plants that are culturally significant to them, you immediately get this big boost of diversity in plants. And you get the benefit of knowledge that is so much larger than just your own single cultural knowledge or what you've been told. Like in, I, I can give you an example of this. In my research on seed catalogs, the history of them, what they document, the collections of them across the country. So there's a, a big collection of historic seed catalogs held at the University of Oregon. There's another big collection at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. There's a third big collection, and there are others, but these were the three I kind of worked with, at the Atlanta History Center's Cherokee Garden Library in Atlanta. Now, you know, you think about seed catalogs and you think, well, I can tell you what, you know, what seeds were being grown because that's what was on offer about how much they cost. And, you know, maybe that's it. But scholars of indigenous communities and African-American communities are going back through those catalogs and they are looking for evidence of seeds that were introduced from their cultural communities. They are finding and able to change what we historically think of as the gardening population to get a much better view of who gardeners were and what they were doing. That provides this inherent motivation and care that doesn't just come because you bought a carrot at the grocery store. And that care that then infuses everything that you're doing with that seed it improves the environment for everybody and diversifies who and what is at a table making decisions about all of these things from how our seed is cared for to who is in control of it and who has access to it. Um, because if we keep leaving only wealthy white men or wealthy men or wealthy people with profit in mind, as our, the only population at our decision-making tables, we will stay exactly where we are and keep deteriorating our planet and our cultures. For sure, we will deteriorate even further, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. The, the four apples that you say is on the shelf today will become two that are chosen first by someone else. And Right, yeah. right, yeah. because they ship well, that's why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they look Great. well. They look well after two weeks on the shelf and uh -huh. yeah, all, all of that. Um, so... Take us through the, the book, uh, say, say from start to finish. We've sort of talked about the, the messy middle bit and we've talked about the, the, the hope side of it. Uh, so just give us a, a quick run over the whole book. And then I can see direct links back to your other book, um, which well, I, and that, I, I get. That, yeah, that is true. Like I, when I was starting to work on this book and starting to do this research, what also became clear to me was that in the earth in her hands, I actually had to choose 75 women around the globe working in leadership positions. And so I had to kind of pick categories of women, like women in public policy, women in environmental work, women in, you know, nursery work or artistic, like photography and um, other artistic work. And one whole line of women was women in seed keeping. So this included Vandana Shiva out of India and her work protecting the rights of farmers and being able to save and sow and share your own seed outside of these, you know, really restrictive and bullying uh, laws of large seed corporations binding farmers to their line of seed, their line of pesticides, et cetera. Um, another one was a woman named Kara Lorees, who is the executive director here in the U.S. of something called the Organic Seed Alliance. Um, and they are a nonprofit who are protecting 
um, what organic seed means and holding those regulations with clear boundaries and supporting young organic seed farmers with knowledge and workshops and resources and just generally improving the state of seed in our world. So if if they are keeping an eye on us and we are supporting them, then we can sort of feel like we're doing some of our due diligence in terms of protecting the larger seed supply, especially for edible seeds. Um, so that definitely started there. And then in my second book, which was looking at e ecologically based gardens, trying to really use photography and writing to reintegrate our gardens into the natural history of our spaces. There's a whole suite of gardens in this book that are all seed based. They are they are gardens produced ornamental and edible aspects produced from local ecotype seed so that they are trying to support the the habitat and pollinators and flora and fauna of their spaces. And so those two threads made me like really helped to get me started on this book. And I I started sort of with the end of a full cycle in October around right now that you and I are speaking, um, end of September, beginning of October, the moment of the autumnal equinox, which is kind of symbolically, not necessarily always exactly, but the the harvest moment where you have completed a cycle, you are collecting seed and saving it, you are moving into dormancy and planning for the season ahead. And I, I start there uh, because that seemed like you know, in a in a circular system, you have to choose somewhere to start. Could be spring, could be January first, but it made more sense to me to start with the beginning of a seed cycle rather than. Um, and that beginning doesn't start with germination, right? It starts with actual ripening and dispersing. Um, and and I kind of I contextualize all of these different research threads into seed libraries, into seed banks, into the seed control and commodification in the natural history of my own place. Like what seeds are ripening right now? What's in bloom? What's pollinating? Uh, what is dispersing right now? And, and, and what is the incredible diversity of shape and form and function? Like the plants that are disperse their seeds with the wind or the water or, you know, the ones that explode and send their seed off by propulsion. I mean, these, these seem like sort of simple and again, kind of idyllic things, but I think just reacquainting ourselves with our own seed sheds and the miraculous diversity of form and function in them helps us remember like that we are just a tiny, tiny part of something bigger, right? I mean, there are 300,000 flowering, seed producing angiosperms on the planet. They've been co-evolving and adapting to catastrophes so much larger than we can conceive of for something like 365 million years of knowledge has been encoded into the seeds that have survived in our places today. Like that is, I will not use a swear word. That is amazing. Like when we really think about it, you know, we're told an acorn becomes an oak tree. But to really like make ourselves stop and think about that, like this little thing that's inert and dormant turns into a 250 year old tree that outlives you, me, our kids and our grandkids almost um, and, and hosts and shelters millions of lives. Like that is amazing. And we need to remember the amazing, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, to take a small step backwards, you yeah. you mentioned your first book at the start, and yeah. I can I can see I can see the links and the the correlations between your first book, and I've never seen it, I've never had it in my hand, I've never glanced through it. The lovely woman Fanula Fallon of the Irish Slow Flower Society is one of the women in it. Uh, oh, brilliant! And and her her work over there, uh, starting and again that that's all based on seed, right? Like it's being able to become a flower farmer in order to have locally produced flowers that are organic and creating economy where you are. That all comes back to seed. 
Yeah, Fanula actually, she lives not too far away from here these days. Oh, she's, she's one of my she's one of my heroes. Yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah, she's brilliant. Um, but the the you mentioned something about your first book, um, mm-hmm. and you were saying that you know seventy years there was a sort of a, a I suppose a a type of gardener was created over that mm-hmm. period of time, and that how that is changing, um, and there and there is definitely a change or certainly an awareness happening around gardens being becoming a little bit more natural a little bit more wild how do you see that changing and continuing to change over the next couple of years and what do you think the you know the gardeners that we have had over the last 20 30 40 years and this perception and need for tidiness and neatness and perfection and all the rest right. of it, well, How do you see it changing? Well, I hope it continues to change, and I hope it continues to change in dynamic and encouraging, inclusive ways. Because, you know, that gardener who kind of looks just like me, middle, you know, middle aged, middle class white woman gardener in her dress, like with a glass of wine somewhere with some throw pillows in her garden, like this was never what gardeners were. It n- never was, but it was a very easy. Uh, marketing target. So it was just a perception. But the problem with that perception in, you know, magazines, television programs, you know, and it might be Monty Dawn, it might be like, it's not necessarily a woman, but it's sold to women. And the problem with that is that it, it leaves us as gardeners with an understanding that what we do is sort of pretty, but not very important. And that it's sort of a hobby. And like, that's so cute. Um, But it also gives us this just contracted version of what it is we do. And the the importance of recognizing that that's never who gardeners are or were or or are completely is just really important because if you keep selling a standard of beauty uh, that is harming both socially, economically, and environmentally, then that's just ridiculous. So to to get more photographs, more talk programs, more television programs, including a wider variety of how we garden, um, I think will lead to the most interesting gardening. And that could be in in the edible realm. It could be in the the naturalistic realm. I think that people are a little bit tired of being told you have to only plant natives and it has to be wild all the time. And like, I think we will get a real exchange of aesthetically pleasing, beautifully designed, but also ecologically contributing gardens. Um, But hopefully there's never just one kind, right? Like, Like there are as many different gardens as there are gardeners. So I think the importance again is diversity and being dynamic and not being harmful, but still being fun and creative. Um, And we're never going to get anywhere, in my opinion, if it's a lot of finger wagging, like you should do this. And you, I can't believe you have that lawn. And I can't believe you have those invasive plants in your garden. Like being shamed into a different kind of garden is not going to get us very far. Uh, And it takes all the joy out of this activity that we love. Um, and so hopefully we'll see a little bit less shaming and a lot more uh, joy and encouragement and some dynamic results from that in both edible gardens, flower gardens, environmental gardens, and land care decisions generally. Yeah. And there's like there's several elements to that, I guess. There's there's number one, uh, perception change. It's it's funny, there's a lot of a lot of people doing a lot of really great things in gardening in terms of, you know, growing flowers. And uh, I see a lot of people, a lot of people that are I'm connected with. And what I find is that over the last good few years, they've created these beautiful gardens and they've been posting all about it on Instagram and so on. But the garden is, I suppose, landing pressure back on them because they're having to keep it in a certain way yeah. in order for it to be, you know, Instagram, Instagram worthy. In, Instagram yeah. worthy and so on. Yeah. And I think that's something that needs to change, like the perception element of it. Um, 
what we perceive as a garden, what we right. want want to get from a garden. Right. And it's not always overflowing basil and tomatoes and flowers and we're happy and everything's green. Yeah. Yeah. And and I do think it, it's interesting that you said that 70 year thing, because I remember my grandparents garden, uh, both sets of grandparents were very good gardeners, different gardeners, but very good gardeners. And they always had gorgeous gardens. They always had abundant fruit and vegetables. Right. But I don't ever remember now, maybe I didn't see it always, but I don't ever remember that there was any pressure from it. It was just no. a very natural no. thing. And I think that's something that we have definitely lost is that we we yeah. have this pressure attached to it. We have to have the lawn cut. We have to have. And mm. um, yeah. I think the perception then is another one because and it's it's interesting because yesterday I only had this conversation. I replaced the large part of a lawn with an, a native Irish wildflower meadow with the idea of reducing uh, the mowing, uh, obviously improving biodiversity and obviously it would look good. And the funny thing about it is it has become something totally different. Now, I cut it. You're supposed to cut it at the end of the summer. I only cut it this week. Um, but the beauty element of it was short lived because you get a peak of flowering. But what has been so interesting since January when it didn't look good, up through February, March, April, when it didn't, still didn't look overly good, looked spectacular in May and June, and then has looked very poor since. Right. But what has what has been huge has been the, not just the pollinator activity, but the nature activity in general. Yeah, yeah. And this it has been so satisfying from that point of view. Right. It has looked, right. It has, it has looked messy for a lot of the time, but it has been so, so satisfying. And yeah. somebody and that's so, different, right? Yeah, that's just different. And it's great. And you can't capture that in a picture. And that's OK. Yeah. And, and it has been it, it hasn't been what I expected. And I've spoke about it on previous episodes of the podcast as well. Yeah, I, I did expect that. Obviously, I was going to see some pollinators and that was going to make me happy. And the flowers were going to be the main star of the show. But it has been totally different. It has been about the pollinators. It has looked good at times. But it's the overall long term benefit that I've seen. I've had different types of birds in this year that I've never had before. And the reason I that what brought this to my mind was um, my friend came in last night and he said, thank God you cut that. It looked horrible. And he's he's driving in for the last three months. But that's the first time he said it looked horrible. And he said that he couldn't have that at his house because he just likes neat and tidy. So right it's a funny thing because there is a bit of a perception change needed yeah yeah it, there is so i went there totally is. off off tangent there no that <laughs> but that's not off tangent because it is that wildflower meadow which is going to seed which is going to become the next wildflower meadow and how you know there i do think that it's important that we figure out a way to balance and to shift like if that friend also sees the foxes and the hedgehogs and the birds coming in you know like he will also get used to it like I've seen people turn around after you know two seasons or three seasons you know and I of course Mary Reynolds talks all about this in her we are the ark and um I think the more of us who do it then the more other people who are more resistant to it will walk by notice something, change something in the way they feel. And and it's a slow journey, but it's okay. It doesn't have to, ha like, we got here in a long time. We can take a little while to get back out, but um, the beauty will, will, will prove itself, I think. Yeah, it's, it's been, we're heading towards the end here. We could actually chat and go down several other avenues I know. so it's yeah as we start to round off it's been a, a really really fascinating chat the book is excellent um i'm sure it can be found in all the usual places so maybe just tell people where they can find the book uh and, and your other everywhere books. you yeah everywhere you get your books there's also an e-reader version and the audio version came out yesterday as well i just it just published on september 19th in advance of the equinox and um yeah, I, I would love to hear anybody's feedback on this very uh, twisty and diverse uh, narrative of a book. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, and for sure, and don't don't forget to check out uh, Jennifer's brilliant podcast. It's Cultivating Place. And again, I presume you'll find that in all podcast players and so on. Yep. Yep. So uh, Jennifer, it's been a really fantastic chat. Um, really enjoyed it. The book is excellent. I'm going to delve deeper into it over the next couple of weeks. So it's been a really ent- entertaining chat. And thank you very much for coming on Master My Garden Podcast. Oh, thank you. Really a pleasure. So that's been this week's episode. Huge thanks to Jennifer for coming on. It's an excellent book and some really, as we as we said there, there's some really important topics in it, but there's also some great stories of hope. And, you know, there is as Jennifer said earlier, with the amount of home gardeners, if we all start doing small little steps, we can we can improve things drastically on a number of levels. And uh, yeah, check out the book. It's What We Sow, available wherever you get your books. And Cultivating Place is the podcast, again, on all podcast players. So that's been this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And until the next time, happy gardening. <laughs>